My clever little screen is telling me we are live, but I'm also given to understand that it takes a while for you all to pile into the event. So I'm stalling for the moment. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening, people watching us from all over the world, especially all over Norfolk, we hope. It's a joy to have you back. Welcome to Pi Calling. And this is our May event. Would you believe it? A year we've now been doing these online events. And I'm delighted to be joined this evening by Professor Dave Goulson. Good evening, Dave. Hi, Nick. How are you? I'm very well. How about you? I'm fine, thank you very much. I'm all the happier for having the opportunity to talk to you. But before I get to talk to Dave, I have a few bits of housekeeping to uh, cover. The first is that while we were in the green room a second ago, David, who's, who's running the event, our wonderful David Fields House, who's our uh, events officer at our Cly Marshes Reserve, his Wi-Fi, for the first time ever in the year that we've been doing these events, his Wi-Fi glitched a couple of times. So if there is a problem, to anyone who's attending, please bear with us. If it freezes for very long, if we did have to take the uh, option, the nuclear option of closing the event down, just come in through the same link that you've already got in the emails and you will eventually join the event. But let's hope that we don't have any problems. Um, you will doubtless have been reading Dave's numerous wonderful books and you will have questions about your own gardens, about our relationship with wildlife, about his research, and perhaps about some of the things we're going to talk about. If you want to ask Dave a question, uh, David will pop a Q and A box attached to the chat and just write your question in that. Some of them I may read aloud to Dave, some of them I may bring you into the conversation so that you can ask him yourself and apologize in advance if I don't manage to get to every question. Sometimes they all come right at the end and we don't manage to get round to them all. Now, you will also be very interested in Dave's latest book. I don't have a physical copy. Dave, do you have a copy on you? You can hold up. So we'll switch the screen now to Dave in the edited version, which will go, there is Dave holding up his Gardening for Bumblebees, which is his latest book. Now I have copy, I think these are the two um, most recent prior to that, which is The Garden Jungle and A Buzz in the Meadow, which are two of my Bibles. And the reason we're showing these is because all of them can be purchased through a link, which David is going to put in the chat, which takes you to the Wild Sounds and Books website. Now, Wild Sounds and Books are our wonderful partners based here in Norfolk, and they stock all our visitor centres with our books and many other products as well, all of them about wildlife and many of them supporting conservation. And by purchasing any of Dave's books through that link this evening, you will also be making a donation to Norfolk Wildlife Trust for which we thank you extremely much because Wild Sounds and Books will be donating 10% of the purchase to Norfolk Wildlife Trust. And we are very grateful today for agreeing to that. And we're very grateful to Wild Sounds and Books for supporting us in that way. So. Essentially, the back titles that they have on sale at the moment are The Brand New Gardening for Bumblebees, The Garden Jungle, A Buzz in the Meadow, and A Sting in the Tail. So I'm, I'm certain anyone who hasn't encountered Dave's work will rush off and wish to buy the entire catalogue. I, I cast down the gauntlet right now and challenge you all to do so. Um, should you be immensely wealthy? We are, as many of you will know by this point, currently in the, the throes, the final throes of purchasing some wonderful land around our amazing Thompson Common Reserve. Thompson, of course, is a Breckland Reserve and it is the most important site in the UK for pingos, which are ice age pools formed by the freezing and, un, um, and thawing of the landscape during the retreat of the Dementian Glaciation some 12,000 years ago priceless reserve and we have the opportunity to expand it very considerably and we really are in the final moments. We need every penny you can spare. So if there are any closet millionaires in the audience this evening, just go to the link that David will post to the appeal page of our website. Thank you very much. And the final bit of shameless advertising that I have to do is to say to you that in a month's time on the 17th 
of what month comes next, June, um, I'll be talking to the wonderful Kate Bradbury, very much a kindred spirit of Dave, because she writes about gardening for wildlife. And we'd be delighted to see you at that event. And in July, we have our Clyde Calling Festival. And the theme of that is closer to home, because we're trying to build on the impetus that we all have from the lockdowns of exploring our local landscapes, of protecting our local landscapes, of investing of ourselves in our local landscapes. Which brings me to you, Dave Goulson, because if your books are really about anything, they're about loving the space that's your own. In fact, if I can quote you to yourself from The Garden Jungle, not from um, Gardening for Bumblebees, but from this wonderful book, which I absolutely adore, for me, saving the planet starts with looking after my own patch and I would say really that above all despite the tremendous environmental harm that you your research helps to expose you're a very optimistic and positive writer. Uh, I try to be um, and I do think you know a lot of these environmental issues are they're terribly depressing it's you feel because people feel helpless you know it's really I, I remember watching the you know the television news last summer of the, the the Amazon burning and you know your heart sinks and you think what what the heck can I do you know but, and it's pretty difficult to do anything meaningful um but but we can all influence what's all around us and so you know the sorts of stuff that I write about how we can look after insects we can all get involved because they're just outside the back door you know they're they're there in the garden and they can be there in extraordinary diversity um, you know, you can have thousands of species living in a little urban garden. Um, even the window box, you can do something to help. So it's kind of nice that it's it's empowering. It's a way of you know enabling people to do something and reconnect with nature and and feel they're making a difference. Which yeah, which is you know a welcome thing in the kind of doom and gloom world we live in. It is, and it's. A fundamental to any, and there's that quotation that may or may not come from Margaret Mead, but don't doubt that small numbers of people can change the world because it's it's only ever been actions by small people that have ever made significant difference. Apologies to Margaret Mead for misquoting her there, but off the top of my head. Um, your books are very much about that business of you have control. I'm pointing at my own garden, which is there and there. You have control of your plot. You have control of what flowers in it. You have control of what to some extent what comes to live in it because you're not using the noxious chemicals and so on that that will do them harm yeah and and there are a lot of us you know i mean tw 22 million gardens or thereabouts in the uk um so you know just imagine the potential supposing they were all you know managed for wildlife full of bee and butterfly friendly flowers and pesticide free with a little pond and a log pile and a bee hotel and all the kinds of things i mentioned in the book um and and even better, you know, if we could get the council on board, so that so that the the other kind of urban green spaces, the parks, uh, road verges, roundabout cemeteries, you know, anywhere and everywhere, they were all full of flowers. Um, then that's a, you know, it's a massive area and a, and a kind of national network of of, of insect friendly habitat. And it's not, you know, it's I probably sound like I'm getting a bit carried away here, but I I actually think it's. It's, it's possible, it's achievable, because it's already kind of happening, you know, people are really buying into this, they, there are lots of people out there already kind of inviting nature into their gardens, planting all the right kinds of flowers, and there are councils changing their cutting regimes, because actually often stimulated by what happened in lockdown last year when they couldn't cut, and everybody commented how beautiful the road verges suddenly were with all these dandelions and things shooting up. Um, so, you know, it's happening already. And, and I, I mean, obviously it'd be great if more people got involved and, and sort of rewilded their garden. I'm not suggesting wild gardens have to be kind of full of brambles and nettles, just in case anyone's worried about that. Um, you know, it's not gonna solve all the world's problems, but it would be a really nice big step in the right direction. And, it, and it's something that, that we, can, we can do, you know, in, in a pretty short space of time, I reckon. Yeah, we'll come later on, I hope, there being time, um, we'll come to the, the gulf, really, between what is sold to us as wildlife gardening and what 
actually is while they're gardening, which is really very much what your last two books have been about, The Garden Jungle and Gardening for Bumblebees. And, and with luck, the 22 million gardeners that you mentioned, once they all have a copy of your book, um, once we've shouted it from the rooftops, then they will all see the light and become proper wildlife gardeners. But before we get to that, let's talk a little, let's talk about pollinators, Dave Coulson, which I'm aware is probably what you do a very great deal of your time. But allow me to read, um, this is from Gardening for Wildlife, your latest book, which you, you feel free to model it again if you want to. Today, about three quarters of the different types of crops that humans grow around the world benefit from pollination by insects. Some, such as almonds, produce almost nothing without them. About one third of the food we eat depends upon them. Imagine a world without blueberries, tomatoes, blackberries, raspberries, avocados, strawberries, cucumbers, black currants, pumpkins, chili peppers, coffee, and chocolate. <coughs> Life would hardly be worth living. Pollinators are kind of key, aren't they? Yeah, and, and not just, of course, for what they do, you know, for pollinating our crops. I mean, the 87% of all plant species on the planet need pollinating by some kind of animal. And it's not always an insect. Um, I, you know, if it's in South America, it might be a hummingbird or something exotic like that. But most of the time, and all of the time in Europe, it's it's some kind of insect. Um, so, you know, without pollinators, there wouldn't, most of the plant species on the planet wouldn't set any seed and would eventually disappear. And obviously that would be completely catastrophic for all life, really, all life on land. Um, so it, you just can't exaggerate how important they are. And from a human perspective, you know, I, that was a bit of a long list of uh, fruits and veg that I, I probably got a bit carried away, but uh, but it's it's roughly three quarters of all the crops we grow that uh, that need pollinating by insects. So you know, it not not just would life wouldn't be much fun without them, but actually the horrible truth is, um, you know, lots of people would starve, um, and it would be really difficult to have a healthy diet because we all, we already don't have enough fruit and veg in the world to give everyone the kind of five a day diet that doctors recommend. Um, take away the pollinators and, uh, uh, you know, we, we'd be way short. Um, but it, I should just, while I'm gabbling about pollinators, which, uh, as you as you know, is, is a bit of a specialist favourite subject, um, it, it is important to stress that, that there's a lot of different species of pollinators and they're not all bees. Um, you know, I love bees. That's the... I study bumblebees mainly, um, uh, but many, many people think that all pollination is done by bees. And in fact, many people, if they think about it at all, um, are under the, the misapprehension that honeybees pollinate more or less everything, which is just one species of bee. Um, but actually there are, there are probably four or 5,000 species of insect just in the UK that pollinate. Um, and globally, it'd be hundreds of thousands. Nobody really knows. Um, so, you know, we shouldn't forget the beetles and the wasps and the hoverflies and uh, all these other creatures, which tend to get no credit and they, they, sh they deserve it. And they do feature large in uh, Gardening for Bumblebees. It's not just about gardening for bumblebees, but there's a lovely pollinator chapter where you where you summarise. Now, before I go on to the next little thing that you've made me think of, um, uh, we have previously had as guests on at Cly Calling, in Cly Calling, off Cly Calling, we've had uh, Bridget Strawbridge Howard, whose wonderful book Dancing with Bees is, is um, telling us all about so many different species of, of bee found in the UK of the nearly 300 species that are recorded here. So a great read and you can find on the Norfolk Wildlife Trust um, YouTube, our conversation, but also in the depths of the winter, the wonderful Erica McAllister was my guest on Clyde Calling, and she would be sitting next to Dave going, stop talking about your damned bees, it's all flies. She, she does have a bit of an agenda there, but her conversation is also available. But just going off on a bit of a tangent, my garden at the moment, for a month now, has been absolutely full of Aristalis pertinax drone flies, more than I've ever seen. I mean, I can't go outdoors without bopping the things on the head. It's wonderful, absolutely wonderful. Glorious creatures. You, you know, you can I, make a, a breeding habitat for, for Aristalis and other uh, hoverflies that have aquatic larvae. And it's, I do mention it in the book, but uh, you can find a YouTube video about how to make a hoverfly lagoon, which, which is perhaps overselling it slightly. It sounds terribly exotic. Um, 
but it's basically a small puddle um, full of rotting material, so but, <laughs> which doesn't sound great. But the hoverflies that it will attract are really interesting. It's not just Aristalis, which is which is a kind of bee mimic, honey bee mimic. Um, there are quite a few others, some really beautiful ones um, that like to lay their eggs in in, in little puddles. And uh, uh, so any kind of waterproof container full of water, chuck in some leaves. And now is as good a time of year as any to do it. And I almost guarantee, put it in a quiet corner of the garden, within a week or two, you'll get these, uh, a whole range of hoverflies arriving and laying their eggs, um, which hatch into these amazing um, offspring, which I, I hesitate to use the name that they're usually given, which is rat-tailed maggot which immediately turns most people off. But actually they're really cool, fascinating little creatures. They're sort of um, fat grub with this long tail that's a, a snorkel. Um, so they hide in the kind of murky soup of this little puddle where birds can't see them um, uh, and send their tail up to the surface to, to get oxygen. Um, so they're, they're, they're really fun to look for for kids, you know. Um, uh, so yeah, every, every, every wildlife garden should have a little hoverfly lagoon tucked away in a corner somewhere. Only, I think it was yesterday, it could have been the day before I was tweeting that um, I, all through last spring's lockdown, um, I had a Helophilus pendulus, the gorgeous little footballer, the stripy ho uh, hoverfly, um, who sat next to me on a rock in one of my little pools. Um, the entire spring I was sitting outdoors, my desk was in the garden and I had this little Helophilus pendulus and I was sitting out there the other day and an offspring of my Helophilus pendulus is back on the same rock. I feel, I feel very empowered by that, but let's talk about making gardens better for wildlife. So in a sense, the Gardening for Bumblebees book, which you've just brought out, is the how-to version of the garden jungle, where you describe the fabulous and diverse wildlife that lives in your own garden, your, your UK garden, because you've covered, you covered your French garden previously. Um, and there are three sort of big things that you talk about. And one of the first ones is, I mean, in a sense, the bulk of the book, the whole second half of the book is, is about appropriate wild type or native plants flowering from right in the spring till right in the autumn so that our pollinator friends have things to feed on. And much of gardening in a way is forcing, traditionally gardening was about growing the wrong thing in the wrong place and being and feeling very clever of it. And that's not really an appropriate way to grow plants, is it? No, I mean, it's one of the, the biggest uh, problems or causes of pest problems is, to, is people trying to grow a plant that just isn't happy. You know, the soil pH is wrong. The aspect is wrong. Um, but someone, you know, they're desperate to grow delphiniums or whatever it might be. And so they keep going and they, the things keep getting laid waste by slugs or, or aphids or whatever. Um, and so they resort to using slug pellets and insecticidal sprays and so on to try and prop up this ailing plant. But actually, if you just accept that, you know, in your garden, perhaps delphiniums are not the choice of plant to go for and try and find something that's happy there, then it'll it'll thrive and you won't need to, to do it, you know, resort to any of that. Not that I would recommend ever resorting to pesticides in a garden. I personally think it's crazy to spray poison in the place where you, you and your family play and relax and so on. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's a huge subject, you know, what plants do you grow um, to, to encourage the most wildlife? And, uh, you know, I could talk for hours about it, and, but I won't. Um, and it's, but it's- Well, people, people just need to buy the book because they- Buy can, the book, obviously that's- a they can wallow in an amazing list and description of so many wonderful plants for our native pollinators. But so just very quickly, I mean, the, as a kind of very rough rule of thumb, old fashioned kind of cottage garden plants and native plants tend to be good. Um, and there is evidence that, that, that native plants are, on average attract more pollinators than non-natives. Um, not surprisingly, because, you know, they co-evolved over millions of years with our pollinators um, uh, and and also if you grow native plants there's more you're more likely to support non-pollinator insects the herbivorous insects that eat the leaves or whatever which are often much more specialized in what they'll feed on um, so I'm um, probably a familiar example of butterfly larvae you know an adult butterfly will drink nectar from quite a huge range of flowers they're really not fussy at all but the caterpillars will just eat the leaves of 
usually one or perhaps two or three related plant species. Unless you grow those plant species in your garden, you'll, though, that species of butterfly will never be able to breed. So, you know, lady smock is a, is a lovely little flower you can grow. Um, bees quite like the flowers, um, but orange tip butterflies lay their eggs on it. And so if you grow a little, I've got some in my garden at the moment, actually, I was watching a female laying eggs this afternoon and uh, uh, they're gorgeous little butterflies. So if you can try and incorporate some food plants as well as flowers, um, then, you know, that helps to, to support biodiversity. Um, so yeah, go native where you can, but I don't think in a, in a garden setting, you, you know, it's reasonable to expect people to only grow native plants. I, my garden is a is a, 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 mis, a mishmash of plants from all over the place. Um, but some of the non-natives are, are fantastic and really attractive to, to, to pollinators. And, you know, I couldn't resist the temptation of growing them, I'm afraid. But anyway, they're all in the book. It's very hard, isn't it? I, I'm just thinking of one example, and 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 obviously it, it loves lambsiers, but um, it, I have um, wool carder bees in my garden, and loads of them. But they, they, I'm not talking specifically about lambsiers. If you want to see them nectaring, plant purple um, toad flax, and they're just absolute demons for it. They're just, I and mean, it seeds riotously all over my garden, and they just love it. They're all over it. Yeah, I love those, and I. I never had them in my garden until I grew lambs here. It seems like it, you grow it and it, they will just turn up from wherever they were, you know, in the landscape. They'll find your garden if you grow it. And it's, it's because they, they're called wool carders, of course, because they, 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 they like to collect these little fine white hairs from leaves and, and use them in their nest. Um, uh, and lambs here just seems to be their absolute favourite. Uh, what well, I mean, that which is also not a native plant. So what they what they did before we started growing lambs here in our gardens, I'm not sure. But uh, I, there must be other other suitable plants. But uh, the, the undersides of mousier hawkweed leaves, perhaps. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I I've I've only ever seen them on lambs here, but they must visit plenty of other plants. They must do. They must do. Um, now, a second thing, and you touched on it a moment ago, talking about your um, cuckoo flower and or lady smock, you said, and uh, same thing, and uh, uh, orange tips. But of course, one thing, if you have space, a great thing to do is create a meadow. And of course, you touch in both Garden for Wildlife and um, the Garden Jungle to some extent. You touch on the catastrophic loss of meadows. So I'll just read you here. Um, from yourself, from Gardening for Wildlife, almost all of our hay meadows and flower rich chalked down and were ploughed up in the 20th century and thousands of miles of hedgerows were dug out. Those hedgerows that remain are washed with fertilizers applied to uh, the neighbouring fields and so tend to grow only coarse aggressive plants that thrive in fertile conditions such as nettles, docks and hogweed. So one of the things we can do in our gardens instead of our manicured lawns is allow the grass to go a little bit crazy and allow one or two of the things that might like to grow with the grass to grow back. Absolutely I mean it is a strange phenomenon the, the kind of obsession with mowing you know this I mean there are lots of people including my dad to this day and he's 88 but he still tries to get he wants stripes in his lawn perfectly straight stripes if he can manage it you know he's trying to recreate a Wimbledon tennis court in his back garden um, and I, I can sort of, I mean, we, I guess there's a sort of tidiness gene in many people and that's what drives it, but it's such a waste of time and petrol. You know, why do people spend half their weekends um, yeah, every fortnight mowing backwards and forwards when actually, I mean, aside from, I mean, a, a tight mown lawn is pretty useless for wildlife, supports very little. And any insect that's foolish enough to venture into it gets hoovered up and chopped to pieces when you come around with the mower next. Um, but if you can just relax and, you know, instead of mowing, just kind of restrain yourself, um, get out the deck chair and, uh, you know, make a coffee or a gin and tonic or whatever, and just, just watch it grow. And it's amazing how most lawns, unless it's a really new or newly seeded lawn, it's almost certainly got loads of flowers in it. Um, and so, you know, my, my lawn here, I guess it's been down for a fair while. I've no idea what its history is, but it's full of, red clover, white clover, buttercups, daisies, dandelions, self-heal, speedwell, all sorts of little flowers that many of them really attracted to bees. So it's basically my own little wildflower meadow and all I have to do is not mow it. You know, it's as simple as that. Um, 
Uh, I obviously it's great if if you've got room to actually you know create a meadow that you just cut once a year. But but if you can't do that, um, just the simple act of mowing less often um, and just trying to become happy with a slightly shaggy looking lawn with flowers in it rather than that stripy close mown lawn um, will will be a big step in the right direction. And if you um, if you're worried about the tidiness or your neighbours are worried about the tidiness, you just need to mow around the edge and maybe a path through the middle. And then it looks it looks like something you pay fortunes to get built for you at Chelsea. Yeah, it's, it is interesting. But uh, it's all about kind of people's perceptions and, and it's it's change, The attitudes are changing, thankfully, it's still got a way to go. And at the moment, um, councils in particular are, are kind of torn because on the one hand, if they don't mow, there's bound to be at least one crusty old person who writes a letter of complaint saying, it's an outrage, it's laziness, why haven't you bothered to cut the verge or the park or whatever? Um, but then if they do cut it, there'll, there'll be at least one person and hopefully more than one person saying, why the hell did you mow all the wildflowers? Um, and the, that balance has really changed just in the last, I think, five or 10 years and more and more people um, are, are keen to, you know, see flowers on roundabouts and road verges and so on. And they, they complain when they see them mown down unnecessarily. Um, so, uh, which is fantastic, you know, and if it, if it becomes the norm to have unmown verges and uh, for your lawn to look shaggy people won't be embarrassed about it you know there is always this sort of people looking over the fence at their neighbors and people worrying that that everyone will think that they're a poor gardener or they're lazy or something if they don't mow their lawn every five minutes it'd be great if we could turn that around and reach the point where it's kind of frowned upon to mow all the time um you know and people are slightly embarrassed to get the mower out unless they absolutely have to and we've got a way to go to reach that point but uh, be nice just going off on a tangent now, um, you keep you keep in, uh, reminding me of lovely bits of the books or of, of other bits of your work. Um, but you were talking about being fearful of what the neighbours think. As a man who once picked up a roe deer on the road, strapped it into the car, a small car um, <laughs> with a seatbelt and left it in the front seat of the car all day, you don't, and then dismembered it on the snow so it looked as though you'd been murdering your children. It doesn't strike me that you would be the sort of man who would be that worried about what the neighbours would think. Uh, no, probably not, but other people are. Sadly. Um, if people want to read about that, it's all in this gorgeous book, The Garden Jungle, which is hysterical. You are a very funny writer. You do very often. I, I, I have a good chuckle. There's a, a very wry side to you. Now, just to finish off with Wildlife Gardens, another, of course, of the very important things we can do is to provide nesting sites for well, bees, you go around drilling holes and everything, but all manner of nesting sites are so, so easy to make and wildlife will just choose to come live with you. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the every garden should have a, at least one little bee hotel. They're so simple to make. Um, yeah, if you if you're totally lacking DIY skills, you can you can buy them. Um, some of the ones you might buy are better than others, and there is a bit of a. I, I I could sidetrack at this point into the. I think there's a slight scandal that some of the wildlife products that are on marketed in garden centres are of dubious um, value to wildlife. Um, including some of the badly built bee hotels, but most of them work fairly well. Um, by aim for one with, a, with holes somewhere near eight millimeters in diameter. Some of the ones on sale, are, their holes are way too big and bees would rattle around. They're not interested, they'd be too drafty for them. Um, anyway, so, you, but you can make one. Again, I've made YouTube videos about it, but just drilling some holes in a block of wood is the simplest way to do it um, or cutting bamboo cane into lengths and tying it in a bundle, stick it on a sunny wall or fence and, and with a bit of luck, you know, off you go. I, my mason bees, which are out right now, um, are, are buzzing like, oh, they've, I think they've probably stopped for the day now, but earlier there were hundreds of them buzzing around the, uh, some of my bee hotels. So it's just fun to, to, to watch, good for kids. You know, you can um, teach them all about the fact that there are solitary bees and social bees and so on and, and explain the life cycle. You can get some bee hotels with windows on the side. They're a bit more pricey, but they're really fun because then you can peek in and and you know see what's happening in the in the tunnels and uh, 
um, you know, look at these little larvae with their piles of pollen and, uh, and so on as they grow, which again is, you know, great for engaging kids. Um, so, you know, there's lots of things, but, uh, you know, the make a whole fly lagoon, an earwig hotel. Um, this is a sort of newish invention, but that seems to work as well. I'm just about to make a YouTube video about that. So uh, keep an eye out. Um, but yeah, why not? You know, it's just they're, they're kind of perhaps not that significant in what they do for wildlife, but they're fun. And it's kind of like the icing on the cake, I guess, just little little adornments to your wildlife garden. Well, wildlife likes edges. It likes it likes spaces, but cracks. It likes to move into things. And so the more of that, the more diversity of structure you can provide for it, then the more species you're going to have. But talking of species, we've got a couple of questions. One that was sent in beforehand. Uh, I'll read them both in one go and you can answer. They're, spe they're plant specific ones. And of course, the answer really is by Dave's excellent new book. But a question from Victoria Clifford. What climber could I plant on a 50 meter east facing fence or climbers that would be best for wildlife throughout the year? Is ivy one of them? So that's a 50 meter east facing fence. And then from Stephen Prowse, we have what top three perennial native plants would you choose for a grassland restoration project to help bees? Okay, um, so for an east facing fence, um, I, I mean, ivy is great. I, ivy is, it's a native plant. It's, it's, it's sort of been slightly demonized. You know, some people think it's this sort of some awful weed that your house will fall over if you let it grow up it or whatever. Um, uh, but it's it's a wonderful plant for wildlife. It has this really late flowering period, which you know it's, it, the flowers are very unimpressive. It must be said, but it, it flowers in September and October, um, which is just the time of year when lots of insects are trying to fatten up for hibernation. So you you see things like red admiral butterflies love it because they you know they're just about they need to stock up enough energy to get through the winter, um, and lots of honeybees visit. He even has his own bee, the, the ivy bee, which more or less exclusively feeds on ivy, which has become quite common in the south of England. Um, so ivy is brilliant. Um, but if you want something, just a, another idea, um, there are some um, climbing hydrangeas. Um, there's the one in particular called um, uh, Hydrangea serratifolia, which most people will have never heard of. And I only came across it because I... Um, uh, there's a there's a, a, a garden at Wake, Wakefield Place in West Sussex and I saw an old uh, wall covered in one of these and I've, I've rarely seen as many bees as, as were on that. Uh, so I planted one in my garden which is still quite small at the moment but you, you can get it from specialist nurseries and that will grow happily on a north or east facing uh, wall. Um, so yeah, Hydrangea serratifolia. Um, three best plants for a meadow restoration. Well, actually, I mean, if you want to restore a meadow, you really want a diverse mix of, of meadow plants. But um, uh, to pick out some of my favorites, marjoram is, is absolutely fantastic. Um, loved by a real broad range of, um, uh, of, of, of insects, you know, everything from butterflies to hoverflies to bumblebees like, like marjoram and it, it, you can even use it in your cooking. So what more could you want? Um, uh, what else was I going to say? Red clover. If you're making a meadow, you need some clovers in it. Let's, let's go for some red clover and some meadow cranes bill. Beautiful plant and much loved by pollinators. Lovely purple flowers, sort of mauvey purple flowers in late spring. So there you go. There'd be three of my kind of favorites, but there are many. If you're making a meadow, get yourself a nice um, uh, meadow mix. There are quite a few suppliers. Again, some of them in the back of my book. And it's important if I can just if I can just follow up from the eminent professor himself, but it's important to get them from stockists or suppliers who provide genetically appropriate British seed because there are all kinds. So, for example, I'm looking out on the village common where I live and on the common and the dry bits, we've got birds foot trefoil. But in seed mixes imported for agriculture, there are bird foot trefoils that are imported from Eastern Europe. Now, they per se are quite nice for insects and insects will use them. But what they do is then hybridize with the native ones, thereby weakening the appropriateness of the native ones which have evolved in our soils over thousands of years. So it's super important to look for someone, I'm just gonna give a name here, forgive me, but someone like Emma's Gate that um, doubtless 
are friends of yours. Um, I, that's not a plug. There's no product placement. It was just a name that came to my head. But they are people who gather native seed from, and they can even source you from regions of the country. And, and as you say, I, in your book. I, I don't think as well, if for, for a small scale collection, collecting your own seeds from local wildflowers, you know, you should never dig up wild plants but collecting a few seeds to grow in your garden, I think, is 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 perfectly reasonable because you you know it's in a good cause. You you're doing more good than harm there, and then they're truly you know local provenance. Um, yeah, I mean, particularly uh, not just sometimes sometimes these plants are from a non-native or, or at least they're obtained from abroad. Um, there's also agricultural varieties of things like clover. I mentioned red clover is a great plant for bees. But if you're not careful, some of the seeds you can buy are agricultural varieties and they're actually polyploid. They're kind of weird genetic mutants that grow really tall and fast, which is what a farmer wants as a fodder crop. But they're pretty hopeless in a meadow. They actually die out really quickly in a, in a meadow. So again, um, if you possibly can get native uh, local provenance varieties. Which is all of the list of stockists that Dave mentioned is in the back of Gardening for Bumblebees. So when you have your copy, you will be able to find out how to get um, properly sourced native seeds. Now, talking of native things and sourcing, I need to read to you again from the Garden Jungle, but this is just pure personal curiosity. Um, it is four years since I planted my trees and I'm quite literally now gathering the fruits of my labors. Not every tree has begun flowering or fruiting. So we're talking about your orchard here, of course. For full-size trees, fruit later than dwarf varieties, but most have, and each year I get to try new ones. Among others, my Ashmead's Colonel, Crimson King, Beauty of Bath and Cornish Gilliflower have stubbornly refused to flower as yet, but perhaps this spring will be the one. What treats are in store for me? I need to know, Dave Gulson, have you harvested apples from those trees? Not all, but some, yeah. The Ashmead's kernel is really fascinating. I, I would highly recommend if you can find some somewhere um, to eat, give them a try. Um, you, you might struggle, you won't find them in Tesco's, I guarantee it, but uh, uh, you might get them in a kind of local grocers um, or grow what a tree yourself. Again, supplies in the back of the book, there's some really nice organic nurseries that'll sell you a, an Ashmead's kernel tree. But the apples are kind of weird. And it, it seems like if you ask any two people to, to describe the taste, they come up with a, a different description. It's, uh, but they're really interesting and so much more kind of complex than the flavor of a, you know, golden delicious or whatever. Um, so yeah, I mean, I love growing apples. The Cornish gillyflower is one that, one of the ones that has done bugger all so far. It hasn't produced a single flower or apple, um, but you know, I'm sure it'll get there in the end. My mulberry also frustrating now. I've got three mulberries. I love mulberries. Um, used to have a mulberry tree when I was a kid, um, but they just won't won't flower. I don't know why. I keep looking at them, willing them to burst into blossom, but. Uh, hasn't happened yet but you just got to be patient if you're growing trees you do and considering that mulberries can live for many hundreds of years i think you <laughs> might be being a bit precipitous there um now we have a question from malcolm i'll, I'll give a, a quick answer so malcolm fisher asks are there native grasses that can be grown and the simple answer is yes and the same suppliers that dave lists in his book but there are all kinds depending on the soil really which species will do well but dave sorry i'm answering the question for you there um no no that that's spot on so i would yeah the supplier will ask you what kind of soil you have and if you're on a sandy soil with chalk underneath there are certain grasses that are going to do really well and if you're on the clay that drags Dave deep into his garden, um, you will have another set of grasses. And some, the more thuggy ones, will do fine on all of them, but you don't really want the more thuggy ones. Um, so get advice about your soil and types of grasses from the supplier. So now on to a slightly more controversial bit. What I've titled in my question, the myth of wildlife gardening, because this is something I've had an, a bee in my bonnet about, to coin a phrase, for a number of years that 
I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what, I will read to you from a couple of your books and then maybe we'll talk around the themes specifically. So this is from Gardening for Bumblebees. Um, in 2016, my research group at Sussex University screened the pollen and nectar of plants being sold at garden centres as bee friendly or perfect for pollinators, pollinators, the Royal Horticultural Society badging, and found that almost all contained a cocktail of chemicals, including neonicotinoid insecticides. This is hardly perfect. And then now a couple from The Garden Jungle, your previous book. While I cannot find it in my heart to wish away these wonderful plants, there is no doubt that our zeal for growing foreign plants poses a threat to our native flora and fauna and has already led to some environmental disasters. And then you list a number of things like Japanese knotweed and uh, Himalayan balsam and so on. Any of the 14,000 introduced plants that we grow in the UK could possibly become invasive weeds in the future. And then finally, possibly Possibly the biggest one of all, the UK used to have about 95,000 hectares of lowland raised bogs, about 5% of all our peatlands, but today only 6,000 hectares remain intact, representing a loss of about 94%. This massive loss is primarily due to two factors, drainage to create fertile farmland and peat extraction. And then to follow that one up, so I'm reading you it yourself, but this is a really biggie. Because the supplies from the UK have now dwindled, much of the peat sold in garden centres is now imported from other countries, notably Ireland, Estonia, Latvia and Finland. Estonia is a wild and unspoiled country where bears and wolves still roam, and it is sad to reflect that great chunks of it are now being dug up so that we can grow begonias. Humorously, but also tragically put, there is a myth around wildlife gardening that all gardening is inherently good for wildlife. Much gardening is incredibly bad for wildlife. Yeah, no, it's absolutely true. And you're, I mean, you're right. People would automatically think of gardening as a green activity, you know, what could be more green than growing flowers and fruits and vegetables and things. But, but of course it depends how you do it. And there are potentially huge impacts, negative impacts of, things gardeners do and uh, well you've, you've you've mentioned many of them I mean if you if your idea of gardening is you know you jump in the car at the weekend and, and move to a big out of town garden center and fill a trolley with loads of annual bedding plants that have been grown in a peat-based compost in a disposable plastic pot and treated almost certainly with a whole load of pesticides probably imported from the Netherlands um, and, you know, a bottle of herbicide, a bottle of bug spray, a sack of fertilizer and a, and a nice big sack of peat based compost. Well, you know, you've just had a massive impact on the environment and it isn't a good one. Um, so it really does depend how you do it. And it, it's I mean, I would sort of say, well, firstly, of course, we just need to think about, you know, our actions and be aware of the, the potential pitfalls. But wildlife gardening is really about, about doing less, about avoiding the things I've just been talking about and just trying to kind of tread more gently, you know, don't mow so often, don't weed as much, be a bit more tolerant of, of, of wildflowers when they spring up, um, uh, rather than, you know, having a kind of strict regime in your, in your garden. Um, but it's certainly something, you know, it's something, and it, I think it's really interesting at the moment because it's, it's almost as if, sort of the, the world is splitting into two camps because while there are quite a lot of us that are, as you know, I talked about it at the beginning, you know, this kind of movement to rewild our gardens to encourage wildlife, which is fantastic. And, and of course, that's why the garden centers are badging plants with bees on them and saying it's a bee friendly plant because they know there's a receptive audience there. But then there are also people astroturfing their garden. Um, you know, I, I, I awful, but they, there's someone 50 meters from me who's just turned their whole front garden into plastic grass uh, and I saw I saw the other day there was um on, uh, on on the internet some company selling plastic wisterias to pin to the side of your house you know and they're, they're obviously they're in flower continually they'll be in flower in January just I mean why would you want that hideous uh, but there are there is unfortunately at least you know a portion of society um, the, the, for whom the garden is just an extension of the indoors. They want it to be zero maintenance, ultra tidy. Um, and if the whole thing can be plastic, then so much the better. Um, obviously that's terrible. I, I 
probably don't need to explain why plastic grass is not a good thing. I hope I don't. Um, that's a whole a whole other campaign. But uh, anyway, so of, what I would love to reach is a point where, a bit like I was saying earlier about it, people being embarrassed to mow all the time or spray herbicide in their garden. People should be embarrassed to put plastic grass down because it's terrible for the environment, it's terrible for the climate. Um, it shouldn't be socially acceptable to do that kind of thing, I don't think. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so, you know, beware. When, next time you go to the garden centre, just think about it. Garden centres are just these kind of massive emporiums to, to you know, consumerism. Um, that most gardens, I, there are some lovely local garden centres I sh should throw in quickly before I continue to slag off garden centres, but most of them are just there to sell you as much as possible and they don't give us stuff what they sell you. Um, they just want to make money, sadly. And, and, and it's worth saying as well that gardeners are really nice people and if you have an allotment or you have a garden, you know, I, I'm thinking about stuff in my garden that I need to hack back a little bit because it's really, my dotted loose strife is currently doing its thing and spreading out across, my soap wort is really spreading, I've got some Jerusalem, Jerusalem artichokes that are just ornamental for their flowers in the autumn and they're spreading it and you know if anybody wants pieces of them, the, the stuff that is vigorous and is great for feeding wildlife is free. Yeah, absolutely. And, and also there are, you know, you can you can plant swap with your friends and neighbours and uh, or grow stuff from seed or whatever, you know, you don't have to go to a garden centre to buy all the plants that you might want in, in your garden. Actually, with a bit of imagination, you can get them in ways that are completely sustainable with no negative impact at all. Um, so, yeah, just just yeah. I mean, I, I of course, you know, everyone will give in to the weakness to buy some pretty flower occasionally, but but just beware, you know. Excellent. Well, we've covered covered what I call the myth of uh, gardening for wildlife. If you want to garden properly for wildlife, you need to read Gardening for Bumblebees by Professor Dave Coulson, who happens to be with us this evening. Now, why, Dave, this is the next question really, why do our gardens matter so much? And just to give you some sort of prompts from various of your books, and these are related to your research or things that you've looked into, but our gardens matter so much in the context of our full on onslaught, our biophobia across the, the rest of uh, the landscape. So talk, us for talk to us for mass scale, uh, about, I don't know, I can't speak this evening, talk to us about mass scale insecticide use in California and Florida, um, just as an example of the sorts of things we think are acceptable as ways of managing what a space, public space, in which humans and their animals and gardens dwell. Oh, well, I mean, the, the whole um, issue of pesticides is, is a shocking one, I think, and um, and there are so many examples of ridiculous practices, it's hard to know where to start. I mean, farmland is, is blitzed with a, an ever increasing array of, of pesticides. Um, you know, just, just in the UK, um, well, in Europe, there are about 500 different pesticides available, twice that in the United States. Uh, they, and and um, it, farmers on average in the UK, arable farmers treat their fields um, just over, spray them with pesticide over 17 times a year on average. Um, so it's really not surprising that, that there's, you know, little wildlife in most farmland, sadly. Um, you know, we've gone down a route of food production, which is making the, the landscape hostile to life. It's, it's crazy. And we really need to rethink that. Because maybe that's a subject for another day. Um, but in our gardens, you know, we, I mean, in some parts of the world, uh, people really do use absurd amounts of insecticides. Thank thankfully, in the UK, I think a lot of people use rather few. Um, but in America, it's it's quite common to um, for the council to come around and compulsorily spray your garden with insecticides from a big tanker um, to control relatively minor insect pests. Um, and I, they have a completely different attitude to insect. They even spray insecticides from aeroplanes over the landscape. Um, so yeah, I mean, thankfully we don't suffer from any of those things in Britain, 
And we could have pesticide-free towns. And this is something I think we should be driving for. Um, there are towns in the world that have gone completely pesticide-free. Um, and uh, hundreds of towns in Canada, Toronto, for example, a huge city, completely pesticide-free. The French recently banned pesticides for any use apart from by a registered farmer. Um, so local authorities can't spray the streets with them. Um, and people can't use them in their gardens. Why, why do we in the UK, you walk around any urban area, you see dead yellow vegetation along the sides of paths, along the sides of roads, in school, children's playgrounds and all sorts of places. It's just insane. We're, why on earth are we spraying poison in our streets and in our playgrounds? It's bonkers. Um, and so I, we should really, there is, there's an organization called Pesticide Action Network, which, um, uh, it's an international organization, but it has a UK uh, office and they're really keen on promoting pesticide free towns It's one of their big campaigns. Um, so contact them if you're interested in pushing for your own town to become pesticide free. Britain's been a bit slow so far, but um, it's really a no brainer. You know, there's no downside uh, to, to this. Um, there are plenty of cities, as I say, that have already done it successfully. They're still standing. They haven't been overtaken by a sea of dandelions and cockroaches or anything you know Toronto looks much the same as any other city so if they can do it you know if the French can do it why can't we do it it's it's a, it's an easy win for wildlife and that is the flip side of that is that our gardens are oases where we have complete control in this country we have you know nobody uses a drop of any fertilizer or pesticide in my little plot because i absolutely love sitting out watching my leaf cutter bees and my red mason bee that i saw today and i couldn't imagine life without them and i don't want anybody killing them so our gardens are hugely important because they are oases from that landscape on which 17 dressings of pesticides are being used every year yeah, and actually there's a, uh, I mentioned the number of gardens in the UK earlier, but uh, the area they cover is pretty impressive. It's, it's about four, 400,000 hectares, over a million acres of gardens, you know, so um, that's a lot of little, little, re little nature reserves potentially. And it's, it's actually a bigger area than all the nature reserves in, in the UK. Um, so yeah, um, there's real potential there. And, and a surprise, I mean, not everything is going to live in our gardens, you know, we're not going to get to, I don't know, you know, really exotic specialist species living in our gardens, generally. Um, but an awful lot will. And I, I, I mentioned in, in the book, there's this extraordinary um, lady, Jenny Owen, who lived in Leicester, had a little urban garden and spent 35 years cataloguing how much, how many species she could find. And if, if I remember correctly, I mean, 35 years, an impressive, you know, effort. Um, but she she managed to tally, I think it was 2,673 different species of animal and plant in a little tiny eighth of an acre urban garden in Leicester. You know, Leicester is not known as being a biodiversity hotspot, but there they were, you know. It's extraordinary. It's like your own rainforest, you know, amazing array of life just right under our noses. If only we do a little bit to look after it. I have a good friend who lives half a mile away on the, on the same river that I live on. And uh, he has, over the last few years, catalogued on Twitter 1,505, let's say, species in his garden. And, he's, he's, and I have liked my way on Twitter through 1,505 species. <laughs> and he's about to move. And I said, there is no way I'm liking another species from your new garden, because I've worked hard for this, frankly. And he's now, you know, he's looking at slime moulds now. <laughs> which are fun. I guess you, you've got to look at everything if you want to you know, go for the record. Go for the big numbers. Now, at this point, a question from Kate Drackley, because before we get off gardens, how often do you recommend that she mows her lawn? Um, there isn't really an answer to that, uh, as little as possible. Um, I mean, the, 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 from a wildlife perspective, the optimum would be once a year. Um, if you don't mow it at all, it'll eventually turn into a forest, which is, you know, it might take a couple of hundred years, but it will start to scrub over. Um, but yeah, uh, the traditional management of a hay meadow would, would have normally been one cut towards the end of summer. So if you really want to go the whole hog, do that. Um, if that's, you know, too wild, and, and it is for most people, you know, people want to have a bit of mown 
area to sit on that isn't too long, um, then then cut it a little more often, or uh, but ideally stagger the cutting. So don't cut the whole lot at once. So there's always something in flower, you, you know, because when you cut, obviously you remove all the flowers um, and things like grasshoppers that if you're lucky and you don't cut your lawn too often, you might get grasshoppers in your lawn, which is fantastic. But if you mow the whole lot, you'll kill them all. But if you mow half of it at a time then it gives them somewhere a, a refuge. Um, so, but the, the short answer is as little as possible. I have to, on the subject of orthoptera, I have field grasshoppers in my front garden and speckled and dark bush crickets in my back garden. And when the dark bush crickets started singing last year, I was thinking to myself, I've arrived, I've arrived. Uh, wonderful little creatures. Oh, I, I love grasshoppers and crickets. They're Thank so you. cute. If I, if, if I had my career again, I might switch from bumblebees to crickets. Be an, an orthopterologist. Yeah, they're absolutely cracking little creatures. Cracking, cracking little creatures. Um, now, I'm going to get on to food, which isn't directly covered. Well, it, it is covered because you talk about fruiting plants as well in Gardening for Bumblebees. But um, in your philosophy of gardening, which I've taken from your several books, um, the wildlife that lives around you benefits Dave's allotment gardening, but also you benefit wildlife by gardening in an organic way. And you make a point very clearly in the garden jungle that we have really lost track of ourselves as a, as a species. We have stepped outside the normal food chain in the way that we behave around food. So to read you to yourself, we modern humans have developed a strange attitude to food. We buy shiny wax apples from supermarket while allowing those on the tree to fall and rot. We ignore tasty mushrooms that sprout in our pasture and woodland for fear of poisoning ourselves where many are tasty and easy, easily identified. Few bother to pick the glistening ripe blackberries that droop from our hedgerows in September. We prefer our food to be as detached from its origins as possible, processed, packaged and uniform. Our ancestors from just a few generations ago would think us mad. Yeah, uh, I mean, it is odd, isn't it, that we've ended up, and I guess part of it is, you know, the urbanization of the population. 80% of British people live in cities now. Um, they don't see food being grown on a regular basis, I, I guess. So we are detached from it. And, and in the meantime, while we've become an urban creature, the country's, the countryside has become industrialized and you know I touched on earlier all the pesticides used in farming we've, we've basically derived a system of food production which makes the land inhospitable to more or less all forms of life um, and it, that's often justified as oh well we've got to feed eight billion people we need intensive agriculture is the only way we can feed everyone uh, so we just kind of accepted that food production and wildlife are sort of mutually exclusive, but they don't have to be. And that's why I, one of the most important points to try and get across to people. Um, and allotments and veggie patches in gardens are the perfect um, illustration of this because they can be really productive. Um, if you're a half competent allotmenter, you can get in the region of the equivalent scaled up of 35 tonnes per hectare of, of fruit and veg, zero packaging, zero food miles, zero pesticides, hopefully, um, healthy food. Um, and that compares really well to industrial agriculture where a, a, a wheat farmer might get eight tons per hectare if he's doing pretty well. And the, but the, the, the most important thing is that at the same time as producing lots of food, allotments are really rich in life, just as gardens are. And there was, a, there was a recent study from Bristol University where they surveyed um, insect life in different urban habitats. And allotments came out top. They were higher than parks and gardens. They were even higher than urban nature reserves. So, so you've got sort of teeming life and food production happening in the same place at the same time. And in fact, of course, the food production benefits from all that insect life because it, it's all in balance. You don't get big outbreaks of pests because there are lots of enemies of pests that will have, you know, the lacewings, the hoverflies, the earwigs, the ladybirds and so on that will come in and help control the pests. So you don't need to use pesticides and you've got the plenty of pollinators to pollinate the runner beans and so on when they flower. So the whole thing works and it's, you know, uh, we need to somehow move away from industrial farming and back towards small scale um, mixed food production. 
Um, and there are some really cool examples of, of kind of small scale farming that use the same sort of principles as allotmenting. I mean, things like biodynamic farming and permaculture and agroforestry and some types of organic farm are using the same, they're basically, in, in, in a short sentence, they're working with nature rather than against it. Um, and I think that's key. And somehow we need to remember, you know, um, that and, and get back to it. Um, if we carry on down the sort of intensive farming route, um, then we're all going to starve in a few decades because there'll be no soil left, there'll be no bees left. Um, uh, and also it's contributing hugely to climate change as well. So the, the current food production system is totally unsustainable, I think. As, as indeed are so many aspects of our lives. Now, you just touched on bees and the insanity of some of our farming methods. So, David, could we bring in Alison Norman, who has a question for Dave? Um, let's see of whether course. we can. Oh, there you are, Alison. Your microphone's still red, so you probably need to unmute yourself. Uh, Hello. There we are. Hello, Alison. Hello. Hello, Dave. Yes, um, I had a question about um, when you were talking earlier about all the crops that were pollinated uh, by insects uh, and you were talking about things like almonds. Um, so I was thinking about the fact that um, fruit farmers, farmers uh, who need pollinators are currently bringing into this country uh, massive amounts of um, bumblebees. In fact, I believe that actually farmers are bringing in or more likely to have bumblebees that they're bringing in than, than they are to have honeybee colonies um, on their farms. And I know locally that's the case where we have fruit farmers. So I'm just wondering um, what, what you think the answer is to, to that um, issue. Yeah, I, well, there is the, it, this little known global trade in commercially reared bumblebees. Um, you know, I think the large majority of people have no, never heard of this, um, but there are factories in, in the Netherlands and Belgium um, producing literally millions of colonies of bumblebees a, a year that they ship all over the world for pollination. A, lo a lot of it's for tomato pollination in glass houses, but they are also used for outdoor uh, fruit trees and so on. Um, and I mean, sadly, I love bumblebees, but that this this commercialization of bumblebees is, a, I think, is a pretty awful thing. Um, it's not so bad, perhaps, when they're used in the enclosed crops, tomatoes in glass houses. But um, it seems a terrible shame when it's used outdoors, because there should be plenty of native pollinators in an orchard, for example. Um, uh, so there are lots of environmental impacts of this global trade in bumblebees. The, the, the most severe, I guess, of which is that it's, it's these bees have escaped beyond their native range and are now rampaging around. So we've got European bumblebees spreading across South America right now, carrying with them European bee diseases, which are wiping out um, native South American bumblebees. It's an absolute tragedy that's unraveling because of this this commercial trade in bumblebees. Um, anyway, the, I mean, the simple answer from a UK perspective is, is we need to look after our, our farms better so that there's a healthy population of native insects to pollinate. And we need to avoid relying on buying in bees, which is not a really a sustainable solution. Um, a lot, you may have heard of the, this awful situation in, China, in Southwest China where they've, uh, they've wiped out pollinators and they now hand pollinate the trees, the people climb up it with little paintbrushes uh, and pollinate the trees. It's kind of an awful apocalyptic kind of vision of what the future here might be like if we're not careful. Um, so basically we need to look after our wild pollinators. It's, and it's, you know, that means fewer pesticides or ideally no pesticides. An orchard should be absolutely teeming with life of all sorts. Old orchards that have been managed organically have thousands of species living in them. Um, so the idea that you, you need to buy in bees to pollinate your apple trees is just terribly sad and shows you've totally mismanaged your orchard. 
on the subject of orchards, and this is just a completely random tangent, but it's a, glo a glorious book. If you're interested in the biodiversity of orchards and organic orchards in particular, Ben MacDonald and Nick Gates published a book last year called Orchard, and it is an absolute joy of a book, it really is. And the wildlife that they document the year through is, is just gorgeous. Now, because she has another question about gardening, David, could we bring in Lisa Griffiths, please? Hello, Lisa. So. You probably need, oh, there we are, you're unmuted. Hello, Lisa. Hello there. Um, I live surrounded by agricultural land that is sprayed you know, as often as you mentioned. Um, now I have about a half acre and uh, I've been trying to do a lot of things for the wildlife here, but am I just, you know, tilting at a windmill? Yeah, I, I mean, the thighs, but it's it's there is no simple solution and the best you can do is grow a nice thick hedge and hope that it stops spray drift from coming through to your garden but it's not going to be a perfect solution of course you could try talking to the farmer but i i doubt he's going to suddenly change his farming practices because of your request um I, there isn't you know if you're unlucky enough to find yourself surrounded by arable land uh, conventionally managed arable land, then I'm, I'm afraid there is a, you know, there is no magic solution. I wish there were. Very, very difficult, but that's the nature of the landscape that we live in. And it's why it's so important, Lisa, that what you're doing is giving at least a half acre space. Now, Dave, I want to touch on continuing with the theme of food. One of the really tricky things, and, and I, this, this came out of the garden jungle, my reading thereof, and I need to make a declaration here that I myself went down the route of becoming vegan because of all these very, these very issues. Um, and you make it very clear that you're not, but th this is something, uh, early we touched on uh, plastic grass. Now, last week there was a, a tweet. Now, before I saw that Chris Packham and everybody else was tweeting about this, I retweeted this with a comment. And it was a garden in the morning had been a rough old grass lawn and in the afternoon was shiny green plastic and the comment about it was that the company said the landscaping company said we've gone from from a hideous ruin to pristine beauty or something like that and and I tried not to be too waspish but I tweeted about it and um it had it just went bonkers around the world and it this sounds really pious and I don't mean it to be like that but as someone who's given up flying, who, who doesn't drive, who cycles everywhere. I mean, I can drive and I do drive when I have to, but I cycle if I possibly can. As someone who gave up his job, which involved traveling because I wouldn't fly anymore, as someone who's vegan, I often look at the sort of the pile on things like plastic grass, which are quite easy to attack, but think that we're not addressing some of the real elephants in the room. So let me read to you about meat from your own, your own book, The Garden Jungle. Um, Aside from destroying the planet, eating too much meat increases risks of heart disease, cancer, kidney disease, osteoporosis, and all sorts of other unpleasantness. Many of them also diseases that are exacerbated by obesity. Already about two thirds of the world farmland is pasture for grazing animals, most of the remainder being arable crops. On top of that, about one third of the arable crops grown are fed to livestock. So that in total about 76% of the, of, of the Earth's farmland is currently being used for meat production, either directly or indirectly. Overall, nearly three quarters of the greenhouse gases produced by farming activities come from livestock production. And then slightly further on, the conclusion is clear. If, like me, you don't want to become vegetarian and think that meat is both delicious and probably part of an optimal diet for humans, then eat a little and eat mainly chicken or roadkill. And there's some charming bits in that book about, about roadkill. My question really, it's not about meat specifically, it's about how much do we, I've reached a point at which I, I can't tighten my belt a great deal tighter. <laughs> um, how much do we as a society need to face some pretty blunt truths? about our own individual behaviors and, and have frank conversations because we, you know, oh, I have a dog, but my dog's not doing any harm. I have a cat, but my cat's not doing any harm. Oh, my car's a hybrid or whatever. We all need to think very deeply. Yeah, well, we do, and we need to be willing to change. Uh, you know, people aren't very good at that. We, we like to be able to carry on doing the things we've always done. And, you know, if someone were to, if two years ago someone someone had said we must all stop flying, um, they'd have been laughed out of court. You know, everybody—it's it's our inalienable right to fly to the Maldives for a 
week or whatever. But then suddenly with COVID, we stopped flying and actually we all survived perfectly well, you know, and it became clear that, that maybe we don't need to fly all the time and that we don't need to drive to work every day and, and so on. So we can change. Um, we just need to realize there's a compelling reason for it and that really we can't just carry on. You know, the world is too small and there's too many people on it for us all to just do what the heck we want. Um, so, so, uh, but it, of course it's difficult, you know, persuading people to, to, to make sacrifices. Um, and I don't know how we easily do that. You know, meat is a, is, a, is a classic one where we do eat way too much meat. And fortunately, unfortunately, global meat consumption per person is increasing at the moment, which is completely the opposite of what we need to be happening. Um, I, I do think actually, it's slightly incidentally, um, there is a case to be made that, so some livestock are quite useful as a management tool. And, you know, so to, to give one example, the NEP estate, which is this rewilding project in West Sussex that I know quite well, uses livestock, the, the livestock, the animals on the NEP estate are an important part of the, the whole rewilding process. Uh, and they harvest a small amount of beef and pork and so on, which is sold for human consumption. Um, but there, the animals are actually benefiting biodiversity. And so, so you could, you, you, I think you can eat a small amount of outdoor reared grass grazed meat without feeling terribly guilty, um, but it should be a small amount and it has to be from outdoor livestock. Um, unfortunately, increasingly animals are kept indoors and an awful lot of cattle in the world these days, they never see the light of day. They're fed on soya bean and wheat and corn and whatnot that could be being used for growing food that we could eat direct. And it's just a staggeringly inefficient and pretty cruel way of producing food. Um, but so we, we've got to change, haven't we? Somehow we need, to, we need to reel all these things in. We need to make people realize that, you know, um, they can't just choose to, drive a long distance to work because it suits them and the planet just can't stand us all doing these things um but what it will take to get the majority of the population to to you know be willing to make sacrifices i really don't know um if we could somehow convey to them the fact that i i mean i on it's this sounds a bit doom and gloom but um i i think it's probably true that that our children and our grandchildren will have a, a more, a harder life because of the fact that we have lived so well in the late 20th and early 21st century. So our actions are impacting on our, our kids' well-being. And if people really understood that, I think they might, you know, people would do anything for their kids, wouldn't they? Apart from leaving them a decent planet to live on. But oddly enough, my last quotation from The Garden Jungle, which I described in my notes to myself as the punchline is exactly this. Most parents and grandparents would do almost anything for their offspring, except it seems when it comes to leaving them a healthy planet to live on. Um, thank goodness we have people like you, Dave, who are, who are flying the flag for biodiversity, both as a scientist, but also as a communicator, because we need people, more and more and more people switched on to the, our intimate need, both personally, emotionally, spiritually, dare I say, for, um, for wildlife, but also in a very practical, very actual, very the air that we breathe, the water that we drink, the food that we eat kind of way. So, so thank you very much for the work that you do in that respect. Now, before I say goodbye to uh, Dave, uh, a couple more things. Don't forget that you can buy any of his books from Wild Sounds and Books and David Fieldhouse, who's managing the event, who has effortlessly managed the event um, this evening, has uh, popped a link in the chat, which will take you to the Wild Sounds and Books website, where you can purchase any of Dave's books, and indeed a whole host of other wonderful books about wildlife. And somebody asked a question, um, I'm sorry, Liz, I haven't had time to bring you in, but you are about a crab spider and identification there is a wonderful spider id guide i want to run upstairs and get it and show you but um in the wild guides series of princeton press and you can purchase a copy of that and it's a completely amazing book absolutely blowing the doors off our understanding of spiders in the uk um, you can also please join us again for future events and they can all be found at ply calling 
www.freerangeextensivelivestock.com. And Dave finished with um, free range extensive livestock um, at our Thompson Common Reserve. Remember the one we're trying to raise um, large amounts of money for. We have a long, her long horn cow herd and they are farmed organically as far as possible. They're only treated for pesticide, uh, for pests if they have severe worm infestations, which actually doesn't happen on extensive pasture because they're self-medicating and they're getting all the nutrients that they need and they're not constantly on their own dung. So should you wish to help our Longhorn cattle spill out over even more of Thompson Common, then please donate uh, your millions. Now, before I thank Dave, there's a big thank you to give to David Fieldhouse, who is our producer this evening. And the reason I want to thank him is because for a year now, he has produced these events and he's done a stellar job. So a big thank you, David, behind the scenes for looking after us. But Dave, thank you very much for speaking to us this evening, sharing your enthusiasm and your knowledge. It's been a huge pleasure having you with us. Pleasure, absolutely. Brilliant. Well, thanks to everyone who's been in the audience. Um, happy gardening all through the summer. Bring bees, hoverflies, all manner of wild creatures into your gardens with wildlife friendly gardening. Have a lovely summer and I hope to see you again in a month's time when I'm speaking to Kate Bradbury. Thank you all very much and good night. <laughs>